Welcome back to our Cyber A channel dedicated to helping you achieve your cybersecurity certification goals. I'm Mike Redman and let me fill you in on a little bit of how we do things. We are a community driven channel. Every week, at least two times a week, I take requests from the comments and create videos for them. Uh, whether it's a specific topic for a specific certification exam or just a broad overview. Leave it down in the comments below and yours might be next. We're currently working through the CISSP certification exam. Let's get started. When it comes to ethics, remember, it is a very broad topic. However, it is a topic that the CISSP exam takes very seriously. As a matter of fact, the four ethics canons of the ISC squared is testable material. So spend some time to memorize those canons. Protect society, the commonwealth, and the infrastructure. Act honorably, honestly, responsibly, and legally provide diligent and competent service to principals and advance and protect the profession. Next, let's spend a little time talking about BCPs, BIAs, and DRPs. The keys to remember here is that a BCP, a business continuity plan, is a proactive plan. It's how you're going to keep the business making money in times of crisis or disaster. The DRP, on the other hand, the Disaster Recovery Plan, is a reactive plan. It is how you're going to react to any given crisis to keep the business afloat. And it's crucial to understand that to adequately perform this risk function, you must have a BIA, or a Business Impact Analysis. It is the singular document that ensures that the business functions are properly appreciated and accounted for. Next, let's take a look at a few ways to defeat fraud and collusion, starting with fraud. The key mitigation used to defeat fraud is job separation or separation of duties. To defeat collusion, we use job rotation and mandatory vacations. You must understand the core definitions of risk, like threat, vulnerability, likelihood, impact, countermeasures, and residual risk. Quite simply, the threat is the thing. The vulnerability is just simply something negative that is taking advantage of the thing. The likelihood, well, it's what are the chances of that vulnerability being realized? The impact is the damage that would be done if the vulnerability is realized. And countermeasures are what we put in place to prevent the damage of any given vulnerability. What's left is what we identify as residual risk. Once the residual risk is identified, the boss has a few decisions to make, four to be exact. Avoidance, transference, acceptance, or mitigation. Risk avoidance is simply doing something else other than the task that created the risk. Risk transference, you're going to call GEICO. Risk acceptance, simply, there's nothing I can do about it. This is how we make money. This is our business. There's nothing further that can be done to reduce the risk. And risk mitigation, the sum total of the controls and countermeasures that we put in place to reduce the overall risk to the organization. To get to these risk factors, we have to perform risk assessment. There are two methods to execute this, qualitative and quantitative. However, no fully adequate risk assessment can be purely quantitative or purely qualitative. You must have elements of both. A qualitative assessment is simply a feeling. How do I feel about this thing? A quantitative assessment, I put hard numbers to it. This is where you'll have to know how to calculate for the SLE. Quite simply, remember this. Two letters times two letters, then three letters times three letters. The asset value times the exposure factor equals your SLE. Then your SLE times your ARO, or annual rate of occurrence, equals your annual loss expectancy. Next, be sure to keep separate the difference between control types and control categories. Control types are physical, administrative, or managerial, and technical or logical, whereas control categories are directive, preventative, detective, or corrective, as well as deterrent and recovery. Directive, preventative, and deterrent are proactive control categories whereas detective, corrective, and recovery are passive in nature. They take into account only after an incident has been realized. 
Some other critical metrics that you should be familiar with to execute the CISSP exam are the TCO, or the total cost of ownership, and the ROI, the return on investment. So simply, the TCO is taking into account both the direct and indirect cost of the purchase of any asset. Differing from the return on investment, what is the benefit, the total benefit, the organization realizes from the purchase of that asset? Next, be sure to understand the five-step penetration test methodology, starting with reconnaissance, then moving into enumeration and vulnerability analysis for the exploit or execution itself, and then fifth, documentation or the after-action report. Remember, before doing any penetration test, you must get signed authorization from the business owner. Next, social engineering. One of the only vulnerabilities that has no technical mitigation. I can't put a computer or a box in place to eliminate people from being people. Simply put, social engineering is the art of manipulating people with the ultimate goal of penetration into the organization either physically or logically. Some of the types of social engineering you should be familiar with, phishing, spear phishing, whaling, pretexting, baiting, and tailgating. And lastly, some other key terms that you should be familiar with within this domain, due care and due diligence. Be sure to understand who is performing what. Due diligence is performed by, for instance, the security manager or the security team performing the scans and, and performing the risk assessments and the vulnerability assessments. Then the presentation of that report goes to the C-level executive who will then exercise due care. Next, we have SLAs, simply a document that provides some level of assurance for a service that your organization needs, like uh, water or electricity or internet service. In return for some consideration, they will provide X level of service. Usually that consideration is you paying your bill. And then the service they provide is either 100 megs or 10 gigs or constant power. That's what you exercise an SLA for. And finally, the Wasner Agreement. It's there to promote transparent transfer of controlled and or dual use goods. It has both civil and military applications. And you can expect at least one or two questions over the Wasner Agreement. Well, that's it for this video. If you like what we do here and you wanna see more, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button down below so you don't miss a single episode. And also remember, this is a community-driven channel. Every week I take from the comments below to make the next sets of videos. That's gonna do it for me. As always, visualize success and you will succeed. I'll see you next time.